It's a great to welcome to the program today, Brian Karam, who's an award winning journalist and author of the new book, Free the Press, The Death of American Journalism and How to Revive It. Great. Great having you on, Brian. I appreciate it. Thanks. David. Uh, pleasure being here. So, OK, I mean, wh when did the death of American journalism start? Uh, wh wh is, was there a particular period where we can start to see this demise? Sure. I blame uh, Richard Nixon and Roger Ailes, both imps of the devil who uh, one came into office and, um, you know, committed as many crimes as he could. And the other uh, attached to him and eventually spawned uh, <laughs> Mitch McConnell and Fox News. So uh, those two together <clears throat> began our journey. And then it was um, Ronald Reagan who actually implemented the first seeds, planted the first seeds of destruction. And every every president in the last 40 years has had their uh, hand in doing it, some more than others, some less. And when we say the death of journalism, I mean, in, in a literal sense, we have media outlets, we have people called reporters and all of these things. So like what what are you talking about? What is it that has had, that has degenerated? Uh, well, the term for one, uh, you know, to be a reporter, you have to at least have a, at least one copy editor. Otherwise, you're just some idiot spouting your opinion and it's OK. <laughs> I'm, I'm all fond of, you know, uh, opinions. But to be a journalist, you have to vet facts. And the process of how we do that is broken down over the years. How we do it, the institution has fallen apart. Look, there's vast media. The, the biggest problem, the the underlying largest problem in the United States with journalism is a lack of community journalism. There are vast informational deserts, news deserts in this country, thousands of communities where there is no local news. And until we fix that problem, we can't fix the bigger problem. The smaller problem has to be fixed with uh, investing in um, community newspapers, giving tax breaks to small business owners. You know, what's wrong with a hundred dollar rebate on your taxes if you if you can prove you subscribe to a newspaper or a radio station or something that's that's where you start because and, and look, governments over the last 40 years, state, local and federal have gotten rid of public notice ads. And those are probably one of the key things that you need to build newspapers. In fact, those those public notice ads provide transparency on government. Everybody can pick it up and go, oh, look, here's an estate sale. The city council is meeting Friday. And salesmen would use those and lawyers would use them to find clients and to find people to relate with in the community. And all of that helped build our communities. At the national level, we divide our communities by going you know, right or left. But at, at the local level, everybody wants a paved street. Everybody wants their, you know, the water to work, the lights to work, you know, the schools to work, hospitals, police, all of those things that we have at the, you know, hey, why is that stoplight not working? We can show up at a city council meeting and find out. But all of those things have kind of broken down over the years because of a lack of local and community newspapers. And until we fix that, and by the way, that's where most national stories start is with community journalism. They start there. And until we invest in community journalism, we're not going to solve our problems. Yeah. So, I mean, there's so many different areas that are factors here, and I'll just name some of them. And then maybe you could tell us whether these are things that could be solved individually or whether they're really all part of the same thing. So you've got OK, on the one hand, you've got the Internet, which has created essentially this model where at very little cost, you can um, essentially rewrite and do reporting by phone rather than doing real investigative journalism that has put pressure on newspapers and other other media outlets to say, well, let's let, let's divest from the expensive investigative journalists oh, and instead all... do this thing. So that's one thing. Let, let me mention a couple others. All right. Well, you, let you... me address them one by one. So oh, OK. I, so I don't forget it. In that regard, the Internet is a great thing. What newspapers and television and radio and traditional media did wrong was to get tied into the perpetual news cycle. Mm. So instead, we can vet facts and people look, people scream to the left and to the right that we're that we're biased, you know, conservatively or we're biased liberals. No, we're biased towards money. Right. Because constriction of the business, we go where the money is. Yes. So you end up with news that you want rather than news that you need. And that's the danger of it. That was a management problem. And that's because we have fewer experienced people in this business anymore who can fend off the, the, the need to go first. Oh, they're showing up live. We have to do it. It's, 
Take a look at the Steele dossier, for example. All right, the Steele dossier came out, and the very first report said, not vetted. This is not vetted information, and yet everyone ran with it as if it were. Right. That's the problem. So the Internet isn't a problem. It's a solution with the right people behind it. No, with, without a doubt. So so that's one piece, the technological factors that have changed things. Second, um, we look at some other countries. There's a fee everybody pays towards public broadcasting. For example, you talk about what about a hundred dollar tax credit if you subscribe to this or that. We also then have the entire debate around, hey, you get a basic cable package and some number of bucks is going to Fox News or whatever, even if you don't want it to. And so people are paying often for so-called news that they don't even actually want. So there's that structural issue that needs to be looked at as well, it seems to me. Well, the problem there is you need to reinstitute the fairness doctrine so that you you know what has happened um, in a recent press conference. President Biden referred to it as informational alleys that we go into alleys where we hear what we want to hear and not what we need to hear. And I call it in the book informational silos. We're all kind of siloed into our own existence, and we never hear what anybody else is saying. Sure. Well, the fairness doctrine helped increase uh, public um, news. It, I mean, it helped spawn the news industry and. So when you reinstitute a fairness doctrine, so you have to listen to at least listen to the other side on matters of, of import, then perhaps you can break down some of those informational silos. From what I've read, though, the, the, the fairness doctrine as it previously existed would essentially have no teeth in, a, in an age but, where so much is. I mean, you need something different. You need something different because of the Internet, to, right? Well, and that's one of the things I say in the book is that you need to have a blue ribbon commission to look at it. You need to institute the fairness doctrine, but you need people in this industry and lawmakers to assess how we can do it, you know, so that it makes a difference. The real problem, the fairness doctor never really had teeth. I mean, it never did. No one was ever lost a, a you know, a, a license because they didn't adhere to the fairness doctrine. It's just that it kind of gave us all a guardrail that we could all aim for. And so public service uh, um, programming public affairs programming, news, all was spawned by that. It, was, it started in 1949 under the Truman administration, and people said, yeah, okay, you know, they said, we're, we're going to sell you the airwaves, but for one hour a day or whatever, you've got to do public news. And so that was kind of, without any, you know, real consequence to it, people fell in line. You need that today. You need at least the guardrail and then discuss how you can make the guardrail solid. But, yeah, it doesn't, it, it won't work. You can't just go, all right, reinstate the fairness doctrine as it existed. That won't work. But you need some form of fairness doctrine to make sure that it and make sure that it does work. What about the sociocultural shift that has taken place in terms of attitudes towards news? And this includes two pieces. One is lack of media literacy where people can't even tell whether they're watching news or opinion. So that's one side, people not really understanding what it is that they're watching. The other side is this sort of contempt. And we could I'm curious to hear from you how responsible Trump was for this or others about if it's adversarial and you don't like it, it's fake or they're lying or they're biased or, or whatever. To what degree is that change in the attitude towards what news is a problem here? Well, taking your last one first, Trump was a symptom, not a cause. Trump is a con man who used existing differences and division and further exploited them. As he told, you know, I can't remember who he told, but he said, look, I, I tell people that you're the fake news so they don't believe you. Right. Well, you know, don't that's old. That's really an old tactic, you know, embodied in, in the statement, don't shoot the messenger. You know, we're just giving it to you, pal. You don't like it. <laughs> Too bad. Go clean it up. It's not upon us to to say now we've lost. I think to your first part, what we've lost over the years is there's a lack of institutional knowledge. And because of that lack of institutional knowledge caused by the constriction in our business and that constriction in our business was caused by the fact that when I first got in this business, there were maybe two dozen companies that ran 80 percent of what you see reader here today. There's five that commandeer about 90% of what you see, read, or hear. Right. And that's because we removed the restrictions on ownership. And so what happened was is larger and larger companies began to buy each other up. And as they did, bottom line counted more. There were fewer reporters. Like if you owned a, a media conglomerate, 
that used to be comprised of four different or five different or a hundred different newspapers who all had reporters in Washington, D.C. for their specific newspaper, you would go, well, I can save money by just having one reporter there. Right. So got rid of a lot of jobs and experience. And it became more popular when I first got in this business. You had to have three to five years of experience working as a beat reporter somewhere in a small market. So you understood what it was to be a reporter. Right. And today they hire you straight out of school and will hire you and put you in the White House with no experience at all. And therefore we lose our credibility because what you end up with are reporters without experience who are more, you know, they're, they're more susceptible to the access journalism. Oh, I, I won't be able to get on Air Force One. Oh, I, I won't be allowed into this room. Oh, I won't be able to talk to these people if I do this. So that's led to what is a disgustingly low level of real reporting in, in the United States. And it's only going to get worse if we don't fix it. You know, it was in 1958 that Edward R. Murrow, appearing before the Radio Television News Directors Association, warned us that if we don't clean up our act, we are destined to fall for nothing but slogans and propaganda in the future. And by God, he, yeah. nailed, we, he nailed it. So what's the lowest hanging fruit? Because you've got the media literacy piece. You've got the media consolidation and lack of enforcement of antitrust piece. You've got regulatory FCC net neutrality fairness doctrine aspect of this. You, there, there's all these different things. What's the lowest hanging fruit that would have the greatest impact most quickly? Community newspapers invest in them and give tax breaks for them and encourage them. And uh, that's where you start, because that's where you build reporters. Some of the best reporters. I've, look, why did Walter Cronkite have so much gravitas in 1965? I think it was when he went to Vietnam and he, he, he developed he put together a documentary, which was all fact based. And then at the end of it, he offered an opinion. Mm. It's not unusual for reporters to offer opinions. He offered one. He said, it's obvious to this reporter that we're not going to win. We've got to negotiate our way out of it. And LBJ said, Shit, I've lost middle America. I've lost, you know, Cron Cronkite. I'm doomed. I got to, you know, I won't run for reelection. Why right. did people, why did people respect that opinion? Well, because Walter Cronkite had the gravitas to, to, to be able to say it. He had covered World War II. He was a radio beat reporter. He had experience upon experience upon experience. What anchor today on any news show has that? What, what, what? Tell it what newspaper writer today has the gravitas of an H.L. Mencken. We don't have that because we have lost institutional knowledge. When you, you know, when it costs too much to have a reporter around, they find other ways to make money. Because guess what? By the time you're in your mid thirties or forties and you got a family, you can't exist on what they're going to pay you in this business as a reporter. So if I understand the community newspaper, a community media outlet piece. It's good because, number one, it creates more diversity of opinion. It's good because, number two, it trains reporters to be ready to go to the national level. Number three, it's good because financially it's it's dividing money up amongst more institutions. Like there's a bunch of different ways in which that is a positive thing. Right. I agree. And, and yeah, yeah, I agree because I wrote it. But <laughs> <laughs> but the, and then there are other things, you know, like I, the reinstitution. Of the I think you need a national shield law to protect reporters so they don't go to jail mm. when they have confidential sources. As a reporter who was jailed four times, I can tell you it's not fun. Um, and then the most controversial thing is, and the thing that's that hurts and bites the most for businesses, you know, using antitrust legislation to bust up the big monopolies. Right. But it has to be done in some respect somehow. And that's why you need a blue ribbon commission to decide how to do it. You have to have more reporters on the planet. There are twice the number of people on this planet today is on the day that I was born and probably about half the number of reporters. That's a problem. Right. And it's illustrated best by a place I used to work, Laredo, Texas. When I worked there in the 1980s, there were 100,000 people. There were three television stations that broadcast in English, one that broadcast or two that broadcast in um, uh, Spanish. There were two daily newspapers in English and two in Spanish. There were probably four or five radio stations that broadcast news. Now, that was 35 years, well, almost 38 years ago. 
and 100,000 people. Today, there are 300,000 people, and there's one television station and one newspaper. Right, Three. right. That's it. There's your problem in a nutshell. Hey, um, we had I'm going to give you two examples to kind of frame this next question. And, you know, you tell me what you think. Under Trump, there was this famous incident where he flipped out on CNN's Jim Acosta and then had his press credential pulled um, after Jim Acosta insisted on asking a question and didn't immediately turn turn the mic over when they tried to take it from him. Last week, Joe Biden, or maybe it was this week, who knows, uh, referred to Fox reporter Peter Ducey as a son of a bitch. And he, he may have been uh, uh, knowingly on the mic or maybe not or whatever. What those incidents, are they equally concerning in your mind? Neither, both, one, the other. What do they mean about the relationship between federal government and the media? First of all, Jim Acosta is a First Amendment warrior and I love it. Uh, and secondly, <laughs> There were two people that had their press passes pulled during the Trump administration. Jim was the first. I was the second. Mm -hmm. And I had to battle the SOB. I'll use the word son of a bitch. I had to battle Trump, that SOB, three times. And I beat him three times in court to keep my press pass. Right. And Jim fought him to keep his press pass. That is what concerns me. I had to stand up in a, in a court, a federal court, with my attorney, Ted Boutros, who was also a great First Amendment warrior and represented both me and Jim. Yep. And and it was it was <clears throat> Ted who stood up and said, you know, the administration said they had to ban my press pass because if they didn't come down on me and people like me, that they were afraid that reporters would run through the halls mooning people. Uh, <laughs> honest to God, they, that, that was what they said. And imagine having to defend that. Taking your time out as a reporter, I had to sit in court for that. Me being called an SOB by a president, I don't care. I, you know, Peter still gets in, and I know Peter, and I, I have nothing against any question that anyone wants to ask in that briefing room. There's no such thing as bad questions, only bad answers. God bless you for asking anything. What may not be the question I'd ask. I may think, well, that's kind of shallow. But it's it's always the answers that that are more concerning for us. You know, there's the old story told of uh, during Betty Ford's uh, days when there was a, a group of reporters, including one fresh off the choo choo, who saw her in a gaggle. And the young reporter said, hey, did your kids did your kids ever smoke pot? And everybody thought, well, that's the stupidest question in the world. Right up until the time where Betty Ford said yes. Right. And then he was brilliant. <laughs> right. You you may think a question is stupid and reflect upon it and go, well, that's a stupid question, but it's not the questions that matter. It's the answers. So I don't care if the, the president wants to call me a dumb SOB or anybody else an SOB. He gave him access and, and Peter can still ask his questions. So there's a difference there, a yeah. big difference between having your press pass yanked, having to go to court to defend it, having a a uh, president fundamentally unknowing or uncaring of what the First Amendment means and what a press is there for, and and a, pre and a president who says, "Hey, he's a dumb sob." I mean, I've heard presidents say that pretty much about every reporter in the White House. So that's not they're not equal, they're not equitable, they're not. There's no way they're on the same level. And if you think differently, I I invite you to sit in court with me or Jim as yeah. we have to fight to keep our damn press passes and keep doing our job. Yeah, yeah. The distinct, the exact distinction I made uh, after it happened. The new book is "Free the Press: The Death of American Journalism and How to Revive It." The book's author is Brian Karam. Brian, really appreciate your time today. Sure, anytime.